morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Jesus heals a paralytic. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. How did they do that? <laughs> and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, what, Why does this man speak like that? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified. God saying, we never saw anything like this. Wow. Thank you, Judy. Hearing those horns out there <laughs> made me wonder, was there another train incident? <laughs> And then one of the songs we sang talked about the trunk, so I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but we're still here, so, <laughs> and that's okay. We are continuing in our series of life-changing encounters, and you can see that this time we're going to focus on the phrase, through the roof, <laughs> through the roof. Now, there's a lot of things that might come to mind when you hear the phrase, through the roof, usually it's, uh, it's related to something good that's happening. You know, you think of uh, the football team uh, game that John and Jason and I went to, uh, and there were just, there was enthusiasm through the roof in Michigan State, at least before the game started. <laughs> <clears throat> And then the, everybody dressed in red kind of took over. <laughs> but maybe uh, you're doing a really good job at your, jo at, uh, at your job. You're doing really good work and your, your, your uh, review, it, it just says that the work that you're doing, your, your attitude, everything is just through the roof. That's, that, that's just the kind of employee that we're looking for. You know, you look for politicians, look for their studies to have their numbers going through the roof. Unfortunately for them, that just doesn't happen too often. You can't please everybody, and most of the time you don't please anybody. But you get the idea. Through the roof has this, this idea of moving up, something moving up, upward mobility, positive, a lot of positive things happening. And today I want us to kind of focus on that phrase as we think about these verses that Judy just read. There are a lot of things that we see even in these verses that you could say are through the roof. The first thing that we could look at is the demand for Jesus. Right there in that verses 1 and 2, we see that the demand for Jesus was through the roof. We already know. We've Last few weeks, we've been delving into different narrative accounts in the Gospels. And just about every one of them, in some way, shape, or form, hints at the fact that everywhere that people went, everywhere that Jesus went, people were following him. The crowds were following him. They couldn't get enough of Jesus. And right here in these verses, just as he was coming back into the town of Capernaum, verse 2 tells us that the people gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left not even outside the door. I mean, we know that Jesus had been traveling throughout the region of Galilee. He had been preaching and healing and casting out demons. He became so popular that he couldn't even enter a town. 
because it would be overrun with the crowds. So typically, he was staying outside of the towns, out in the rural areas, and people still came to him. Mark called him in chapter 1, called, called those places the lonely places that he was staying. Well, they weren't lonely because the crowds were right there with him. And they just came from everywhere to see Jesus. But in our text today, he was coming in to Capernaum, into a village. It was a fishing village. It's located in the region of Galilee, right on the Sea of Galilee. It was a fishing village. So it's where Simon and Andrew, as well as the brothers James and John, it's where they all lived. And it's where, it was their headquarters for their fishing operations. And not only were they fishermen, but they were the first disciples that were called to follow Jesus. And if you read Mark chapter 1 and you follow along with Jesus' comings and goings, you can see that it is reasonable to conclude that in our text, the house that Jesus is in, that he is preaching in, is actually Simon's home. If you read some of that and, and go back to the beginning of Mark, you, you can make that conclusion. It appears that Jesus is just really at the very beginning of launching his public ministry. And Simon's home at that time at least doubled as ministry headquarters for a few days or for a few weeks. And so, as had quickly become the norm, Simon's house was packed to the gills. And people were even standing outside trying to hear Jesus is preaching. The crowds followed him everywhere. The demand for Jesus was through the roof. But then something happened in verses 3 and 4. There were these, there was this paralytic and his four friends who brought him to Jesus. And these men, their determination to bring their friend to Jesus was through the roof. Simply reading verses 3 and 4. It just kind of brought up a lot of questions for me. Maybe it does for you too. Think about just the sheer planning and coordination that they had to go through to bring their friend to Jesus. How far did they have to travel? Was it from a block over? Was it clear across town? Was it from the next region or the next town? I don't know how far they had to travel. But no matter how far they had to travel, they had to put some planning into it. They had to put some thought and preparation into it. Another question I have has to do with the physical exertion, you know, carrying that mat with their friend on it, even though there was four of them, had to be awkward. It had to be awkward. Um, how, you know, they had to put forth a lot of energy and effort, especially if they came from a farther distance. And who knows how much the paralytic weighed? You know, typically, People who don't, aren't able to move, it's easy for them to gain weight. We don't know how much he weighed. So if they came from a long distance carrying a person who was really heavy, I mean, just the physical exertion itself, they were determined in spite of that. Now, some other questions that, as far as when they got there, the obstacles that they had to overcome. Think about that. They were blocked by the crowd. They thought they were bringing their friend to see Jesus. And they get to this house, and man, there's just people everywhere. They were blocked by the crowd. How did they end up getting on top of the house? You know, can you see them running around trying to find the ladder? Can you see four people trying to haul one person up on? I don't know how they did that. How did they make a hole in the roof? <laughs> how did they make a hole in the roof? I mean, they didn't. I, I can't believe that they were prepared to do this. They uh, brought all those tools that they would need, you know, some hammers and saws and those kinds of things. I don't know that they, they were prepared for that, but they somehow were so determined that those obstacles didn't stop them. How did they lo lower the paralytic through the roof? Did they bring ropes with them or did they just scramble around and find that? Did they just drop him in? I don't know. <laughs> Hope they didn't just drop him in. <laughs> But you, you think of all these obstacles that they had to overcome. These men were determined. They were not going to let anything get in the way of bringing their friend to Jesus. All the planning and the 
coordination that this project required, the physical exertion, the obstacles that they had to overcome. They were absolutely determined to bring their friend to Jesus. I wish I had that kind of determination. I wish we had the same kind of determination. I, I don't like to have to plan things. I'm the guy that if you want to do something and you got a plan, call me and I'm on board. I'll help you all I can. I just don't like having to plan it. I certainly don't want to have to work too hard. You know, I'll help you up to a point, but when it gets too hard, I, I might have hurt my back or I might, something might have happened. I, I might have to excuse myself. And oh my goodness, if there is the slightest obstacle, the slightest bump in the road, if things don't go just right at the first sign of trouble, I'm ready to pack it in and go home. Isn't that how we are? You know, we don't prepare well. We don't put forth much effort and we give up way too easily. <laughs> Some friends we are, huh? I don't know about you, but I want to be a better friend. Thank God I had a determined family member or friend who didn't give up on me. Thank God that I had a determined uh, friend that just wouldn't give up on me. They just kept coming and, and letting me know of God's love and my need for forgiveness, my need for God's healing in my life. That's the kind of friend that I want to be to others. That's the kind of friends this church should be known for. The kind of friends who'll do anything it takes, no matter how hard it is, for as long as it takes, in spite of the challenges and difficulties, the kind of friends who are determined to bring their friends to Jesus. I want us to be that kind of friend. Friends who's Determination is through the roof. Another example of through the roof in these verses is the declaration of Jesus. The declaration from Jesus. It was, it was through the roof. We read in verse 5 that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. The declaration in and of itself is pretty awesome. Hey, your sons are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. But look at what it says at the very beginning of, chapter, of verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? When Jesus saw the faith of those four determined friends. That's when he looked at the paralytic and said, son, your sins are are forgiven. As far as we know, paralytic didn't say anything to Jesus. At least it's not recorded. It's possible that he did. But either way, Jesus declared that the paralytic's sins were forgiven because of the faith of his friends. I don't know about you, but that's a little intimidating to me. Oh, I want to be a better friend, but to have the realization that my faith in bringing my friend to Christ can have something to do with him extending forgiveness and love to them because of my faith. Don't get me wrong. That person needs to make their own decision to follow Christ. But God allows us to join him in, in the work that he's doing. As we bring others to Jesus and we act on our faith to bring our friends to Jesus. And it, it, it starts something, a process of, of renewal and transformation and salvation in the life of that person. And I get excited about that. Yes, it's a little intimidating, but it's also exciting. I get excited about that. So this declaration from Jesus, it was through the roof, not only for the paralytic, but also for those friends. Jesus endorsed their faith. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, in a situation where something good's all happening, there's always going to be the negative people. 
There's always going to be the naysayers, the skeptics, the doubters. And in this case, the disdain of the religious leaders was <coughs> through the roof. Verse 6 says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I can hear them now just critiquing every little thing that happened. Why are we having to cram ourselves into a fisherman's house to hear Jesus? It's so small and cramped and uncomfortable and it smells like fish. Criticizing the four friends. I mean, who do they think they are? A bunch of riffraff rednecks tearing up Simon's house. All of a sudden they care about the fisherman's house, right? <laughs> Bringing that paralyzed man in through the roof, interrupting Jesus' message, disturbing everyone else and making such a mess. But they unleashed their harshest criticism when Jesus forgave the paralytic's sins. What did he just say? How dare he? Who does he think he is? Jesus knew who he was. The problem was they didn't. Because <laughs> if they'd have really known who he was, they wouldn't have had any problem whatsoever with what he said. The religious leaders, their disdain was through the roof. But there was also something else that kind of countered that. It was the discernment of Jesus. The discernment of Jesus was through the roof. Immediately, it says, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were saying in their hearts. Last week, we talked about the woman with the issue of blood. And when she touched Jesus, immediately... She knew that she had been healed. And in this same way, Jesus immediately knew what was happening, what they were thinking in their minds. They weren't brave enough to come out and say it, but they were thinking it. So just like Jesus exposed the woman with the issue of blood last week, what she wanted done and kept in private, he said, no, nope, we're going to make it public. He's doing the exact same thing with these religious leaders. He says, you can think that in your minds, but I'm calling you out on it. And he makes it public. Verse, uh, the, the, the four friends, the, the, the crowd, even the religious leaders, they had just come for one thing and one thing only. They wanted to see the show. You know, and then when this paralyzed man came up, uh, appeared on the scene, they thought, oh, we're really going to see a show now because we're going to get to watch Jesus heal this man. We've heard about it. Maybe we haven't seen it. Now we're going to get to see it. But they weren't even thinking about the man's spiritual condition. They weren't even thinking about the man's need for forgiveness. They just wanted to see this display of power, whether they believed in God's power or not. They just wanted to see it. It was cool. It was popular. It was happening. And they could go home and, hey, I was there when Jesus did this. It's one thing to say that you're going to heal this man, but it's quite another thing to say that your sins are forgiven. If Jesus would have just healed the man, everything would have been fine. But that one phrase, your sins are forgiven, caused all the problems. The discernment of Jesus was through the roof and he addressed it. He said, let's get it out in the open. This is your problem with what I said. The discernment of Jesus was through the roof. The next thing there in these verses is in verses 10 through 12 where the display of divinity. Jesus' display of divinity was through the roof. As he addressed everything that those religious leaders were thinking, the questions that they were bringing up. Who does he think he is? How dare he say these things? Oh, he knew who he was. They said, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus just laid it out for them and explained to them, hey, it's just as easy to forgive sins as it is to heal a paralytic. So why is this an issue? 
You may remember when Jesus had a debate with some of the same religious leaders over the Sabbath. And they were complaining about him healing someone on the Sabbath. He says, do you not go and help your donkey out of the ditch on the Sabbath? What's the big deal? And that's what Jesus is saying here. For me to be able to give, forgive sins is just as easy as it is to tell this man to get up, take his mat and walk. But then he said, he just kind of doubles down and he says, but I want you to know. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority. I'm not just making a statement claiming to be the Son of Man. I'm going to put on a display of my divinity so that you can know that I have authority to forgive sins. And he says, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. In verse 12, he got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, even those religious leaders. They were amazed. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. A demonstration, a display of divinity. Well, we've dealt with, dealt with the text. Kind of covered over what was going on there. It is a narrative text. There's no specific teaching or commands in the text, except for maybe one, where Jesus commanded the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and walk. He was talking to the paralytic. What does that mean for us? We have to be careful about drawing doctrine and theology out of narratives. But we do, we are, a, we are given these narratives so that we can learn about Jesus, learn about his character, who he is, the things that are important to him. And I think there are some things that we can learn from this text. The first thing we observed in this text was that Jesus was in demand. He was popular. The Gospels are full of accounts reporting how crowds of people followed Jesus wherever he went. The reason that Jesus was so popular is because people were attracted not only to what he said, but maybe even more so to how he said it. Nowadays, our society doesn't seem to have much interest in Jesus. He just isn't as popular as he was at that time. Another thing that we learned was that the religious people had, a, had disdain, disdainful attitudes toward Jesus. They were judgmental, not only to Jesus, but toward the people who were following Jesus. They were even critical of Jesus himself and in his teachings. And we see in the text, they were critical of his identity, or at least who he claimed to be, even when he proved who he was. Over and over again, not only through miracles, but you have to consider he, fulfilled, he was fulfilling prophecy as well as he went along. Jesus, every breath he, and every step he took, he was proving over and over again that he was the Messiah. He was the chosen one of God. He was the son of God. I can't help but wonder if the reason that Jesus' popularity in it might be waning today might be because of the disdainful attitudes of religious people. Mm, my toes are starting to hurt. <laughs> Could it be that we still project judgmental and critical attitudes that do not attract people to Jesus? Is it any wonder that people are turning away from the church in droves? In fact, we don't need to worry about the back door anymore because the numbers are through the roof. People are paralyzed in their sin. But they don't recognize the church as a place that they can get help. And unfortunately, the places that they do turn to for answers rarely help them find Jesus. 
In fact, they most commonly lead them farther and farther away from Jesus. Maybe Jesus has a marketing problem. A public needs to get a new PR firm. I can't help but think that people who claim to be his followers, but look and live like the rest of the world, we're probably the biggest contributors to the problem. What are we as his followers and as his church, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Because we might be paralyzed in a lot of ways, but these, there's something we can do about it. Before I address that question any farther, I just want to touch on one or two other things that we observe in the text. I want to go back and kind of talk about Jesus' discernment and his display of divinity. See, one of my prayers for me personally and for this church is that Jesus would display his divinity, his love and his power. I pray that he would do that through me, through us in this community. That people would not come into this place and experience judgmental and critical spirits, but instead they would experience love and acceptance and a welcoming that is through the roof. See, in order for that to happen, we must have some discernment of our own that Jesus is more than happy to extend to us as we grow in his image, as we become more like him, as we read his word and apply it to our lives. We must have the discernment of Jesus. We must allow him to transform our minds through his word so that we can think like him. Only then will we put ourselves in a position to see a display of divinity in our lives as well as around us in the lives of others. So I come back to the question, what are we going to do about this PR problem? <laughs> How much of it falls on our shoulders? Some of us have volunteered to be spiritual paralytics. Let me say that again. Some of us have volunteered to be spiritual paralytics. Some of us have just willingly laid down and decided we're done. I've got my ticket to heaven. I prayed the prayer. I've been dumped in the water and I, I don't need to do anything else. Boy, oh boy. There's the PR problem right there. I believe that we need to get serious about our faith. And a faith that just relies on Jesus to save us from our sins, to forgive us for our sins. Well, we see in the life of the paralytic, it doesn't, that doesn't take a whole lot. Jesus said that's an easy thing. That's an easy thing to do. But he told the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and walk. Some of us need to get up. Some of us need to take our mat and walk. You remember last week we talked about the, paralyzed, the uh, woman with the issue of blood. And we, we drew a comparison between the command go and the same command go in the Great Commission. Yes, it was two different Greek words, but they meant the same thing. As you go, as you live your life, Live in peace. But you know she was telling people about what Jesus did for her. I got to believe this paralytic, even though Jesus told him to go home, I got to believe he was telling people every chance he got what Jesus had done for him. You go through a life-changing encounter like that, and how do you not talk about it? Well, the real life-changing encounter is when our sins are forgiven and our ability to have a relationship with God. Those doors are open 
wide open. Our relationship with God can be restored. And we can experience abundant life living in Christ. I think we need to get serious about our faith. Do we really believe what we say we believe? We come in and we hear this Bible preached. We hear the truth described and presented in the songs that we sing. We go faithfully to Bible study groups. We read our Bibles on, on, on our own. Does it really make a difference in our lives? Does it really change us? Do we believe what we say we believe? What do we do with that? Do we understand the reality of that we have spiritual gifts? Do we practice our spiritual gifts? Do we share our faith with others? Not only in words, but in practical ways. Like those four friends. Can't get more practical than what they did. They picked up their friend and regardless of the distance, regardless of the physical exertion, regardless of the obstacles, they brought their friend to Jesus. And they got to see Jesus do something in that friend's life that they never seen before. That's the friend I want to be. I want to see that I want to have that through the roof life-changing encounter with Jesus. And I want the same for this church and I want the same for my friends and I want the same for this community and this world. We can have that. And Jesus wants us to have that. Let's get serious about our faith. And allow God to do something amazing in our lives, through our lives, and around this world. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your word. You are such a faithful God, even when we are unfaithful. When we let you down so often, you never give up on us. Lord, there are times in our lives when we're paralyzed. It might be due to fear. It might be due to doubt. It might be due to frustration or any other number of things. Sometimes just sheer ignorance. But Lord, you can heal us. You can, you can heal us and you tell us to stand up and to walk. Lord, I pray that each one of us would be obedient to your command today to follow you, to walk, and to be able to share our faith with others, just to live out our faith as we go. And Lord, we just thank you for the word that you've given us today. And as we close with this song, Lord, I just pray that you would take these things that we've learned and just drive them into our hearts and minds. Let us ponder them throughout the week and let us just think more. How can we apply your word into our lives, into our daily lives, the things that we do. Do we really believe what we say we believe? And do we live in such a way that reflects that? So Lord, we thank you again for your word. And we love you. In Jesus' name. Donna, would you share with us? I don't think I'm going to read that scripture again the same way. You know, after this morning, I think the lessons have gone through the roof in my mind and into our hearts, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking of Ephesians 6 that says, finally, all of us, be strong in the Lord. Yes. We don't have to lie down on our mats. That's right. <laughs> you know, because we have his mighty power, it says. So then it says, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against all the devil's schemes. And then it goes on to say, stand firm, he says, 
So when the day comes, any kind of evil, you may be able to stand your ground. And thinking of that, um, you know, a while ago I wrote this song, so these, this team is going to help us um, sing this song, Lord, and make it a prayer. I'll start. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you.